modern London. We live in a technological world where all our senses have been subordinated to the visual. We watch movies, we watch television, we go and see plays, we see concerts, we watch music on MTV, we download videos to our iPod. And communication has become visual too. We text, we email. And this involves a loss of nuance, a loss of the understanding of how the subtleties of language work. Behind me is Shakespeare's Globe, the 16th century cultural heart of London, of a society that knew how to listen. Elizabethans went to hear plays. They stood for hours to listen to sermons. The word auditor comes from someone who listens to a series of figures and works them out in his brain. I want to rediscover that language through Shakespeare. I want to rediscover our ability to listen. Not by discussing the academic side, the artistry, the folklore that surrounds Shakespeare, but by looking at the commercial world he moved in and discovering how that made actors in his day listen. I want to turn you all into Shakespearean actors. I hope you'll have a lot of fun. I hope you'll discover quite a bit about Shakespeare that you didn't know before. But above all, I hope to unblock your ears. I am a, a firm believer that you can't understand Shakespeare until you understand not just the building up there, but the way the actors worked in the, in the 1590s, <coughs> 1600s, because it's very different being an actor then than it is being an actor now, fairly obviously. And not just because we do television and film and they didn't, because the world of theatre is so different. So how many of you have acted? How many of you have ever been in a play of any sort? <coughs> Good, quite a few of you. Because um, I'm not just going to talk at you for an hour. Some of you are going to come up and have to do some acting for me. Um, horror crossing the front row's faces here. So what you've got to do with this is you've got, you've got to turn this into, into theatre. Because, I mean, what you did there was a play reading, and it was a very good play reading. But ultimately, you got the lines in the right order. Well, whoop. You know, I would suggest you have not travelled all the way from this, wherever you're from in the States to come over to England to study theatre and go to the theatre in the West End, hoping against hope that we're going to get the lines in the right order. You sort of assume that's going to happen. So what you've got to do with this is make it theatre. But you don't have a director, as we understand it. You don't have rehearsals, as we understand them. So how do you do it? Well, I think the only thing you can do is listen. So what else are you listening for? What else are people going to say on stage that's going to affect what you do? Oh, like what? Some sort of direction, come with me, let go of me. Stand up for a second, would you? Just stand up for a moment. Very good, now sit down. Now, don't listen to me for the next 10 or 15 seconds, okay? Ignore me completely. Stand up. Play stopped. Actor not listening. Very good, you can start again. Um, absolutely right. Directions. People tell you what to do on stage. What do we call those in a modern edition of Shakespeare? They tend to come in brackets in italics. Stage direction, yeah. Most stage direction you read in Shakespeare is later, a later edition. Shakespeare tends to have stage direction spoken because that way it will happen. Stand up, sit down, bring my book to me here in the orchard, lie in my tent and sleep, die. You know, helpful hints like that. If, if Hamlet puts a sword into you and says die, unless your next line is no, you die, it's a fairly <laughs> safe bet to hit the deck because Shakespeare's telling you what you're to do. So yeah, you're listening for stage direction, that's very good. I think there's one other thing, and I think this is where it gets ugly. Stage direction tells you what to do, doesn't it? What about if someone describes what you're doing? If someone describes what you're doing, you are not going to know that you are doing it until they describe you as doing it, because their lines won't be in your script. So you don't know that you're doing it until you're described as doing it, but by the time you're being described as doing it, you're meant to be doing it. Do you see that? This is how fast these actors have to think, how closely they have to listen, and how fast they have to think. This is, this is easier demonstrated than explained, and I'm going to stop asking for volunteers, and I'm going to point at people. Um, you are now Friar Lawrence, get rid of that. Uh, Friar Lawrence in Romeo and Juliet, so you're an elderly priest. Very good, Paris is page. <laughs> Maverick costume, but nonetheless. Elderly priest, Paris is page. We walk on stage, and you don't know what I'm going to say, agreed? Yep. Here we go. Here is a friar that trembles, sighs, and weeps. Oh, very good. Very good. Sit down. It's much funnier when people get that wrong. I have to tell you, that was, that was impeccable. The point being, of course, that Lawrence doesn't know that he is trembling or sighing or weeping until I tell him. 
So in a time it takes 3,000 people to stop looking at me and look at you, you've got to be trembling and sighing and weeping. You know, if you're not, you're you know, standing on stage, you've seen your friends in the audience, so you're going, you know. <laughs> Here is a friar that trembles as You're going to be unemployed by 3 o'clock for being rubbish. And it brings me really to, to, to one of the main things I want you to take away from today, which is what these plays are. Because I have no doubt most of you have had to study Shakespeare at school. And we all write long, learned papers on what it all means and the characterization of philosophy. And we discuss text a lot. Um, and then people talk about the text. And we talk about quartos and folios and the text. Uh, and you know, if you go to the Folger Library in Washington, DC, which is the best Shakespeare library in the world, you can see a copy of the first folio. And it's kept in a climate-controlled box with a man with a gun standing next to it because it's the text, which is fine and dandy, but actually doesn't get you very much closer to understanding Shakespeare, I think. Because what these plays are, is they are a blueprint for performance. They're there to tell the actor how to do it. And if you know what you're looking for in a Shakespeare script, I'm out of a job, because you don't need a director. You've got one. He just happened to die in April 1616. Because Shakespeare directs it by how he writes it.